Hi y'all, Larry Powell II here with another reading video where I read it from The Eye of the World, book one of the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan. And today I'm going to be reading chapter number 11. Chapter 11, The Road to Taran Ferry. On the hard-packed dirt of the north road, the horses stretched out, manes and tails streaming back in the moonlight as they raced northward, hooves pounding a steady rhythm. Land led the way, black horse and shadow-clad rider all but invisible in the cold night. Moraine's white mare matching the stallion stride for stride was a pale dart speeding through the dark. The rest followed in a tight line as if they were all tied to a rope with one end in the warder's hands. Ran Gallop last in line with Bone Marilyn just ahead and the others less distinct beyond. The gleeman never turned his head, reserving his eyes for where they ran, not what they ran from. If Trollocs appeared behind or the fade on its silent horse or that flying creature, the drag car, it would be up to Ran to sound an alarm. Every few minutes he craned his neck to peer behind while he clung to Cloud's mane and reins. The drag car, worse than Trollocs and Fades, Thoman said, but the sky was empty and only darkness and shadows met his eyes on the ground, shadows that could hide an army. Now that the gray had been let loose to run, the animal sped through the night like a ghost, easily keeping pace with Land Stallion, and Cloud wanted to go faster. He wanted to catch the black, strained to catch the black. Ran had to keep a firm hand on the reins to hold him back. Cloud lunged against his restraint as if the gray thought this were a race, fighting him for mastery with every stride. Rand clung to saddle and reins with every muscle taut. Fervently, he hoped his mount did not detect how uneasy he was. If Cloud did, he would lose the one real edge he held, however precariously. Lying low on Cloud's neck, Rand kept a worried eye on Bella and on her rider. When he had said the shaggy mare could stay with the others, he had not meant on the run. She kept up now only by running as he had not thought she could. Land had not wanted Egwin in their number. Would he slow for her if Bella began to flag? Or would he try to leave her behind? The SD the or Acidi and the Warder thought Rand and his friends were important in some way. But for all of Moraine's talk of the pattern, he did not think they included Egwin in that importance. If Bella fell back, he would fall back to whatever Moraine and Lan had to say about it. Back where the Fade and the Trollocs were, back where the drug, drug car was. With all his heart and desperation, he silently shouted at Bella to run like Bella to run like the wind. Silently, silently tried to will strength into her run. His skin prickled, and his bones felt as if they were freezing, ready to split open. The light helped her run, and Bella ran. On and on they sped, northward into the night. Time fading into an indistinct blur. Now and again, the lights of farmhouses flashed into sight, then disappeared as quickly as imagination. Dogs' sharp challenges faded swiftly behind or cut off abruptly as the dogs decided they had been chased away. They raced through darkness, relieved only by watery pale moonlight, a darkness where trees along the road loomed up without warning, then were gone. For the rest, murky, for the rest, murk surrounded them, and only a solitary nightbird's call, nightbird's cry, rather, lonely and mournful, disturbed the steady pounding of hooves. Abruptly, land slowed, then brought the file of horses to a stop. Rand was not sure how long they had been moving, but a soft ache filled his legs from gripping the saddle. Ahead of them in the night, lights sparkled as if a tall swarm 
of fireflies held one place among the trees. Ran frowned at the lights in puzzlement. Then suddenly gasped with surprise the fireflies were windows. The windows of houses covering the signs and top of a hill. It was Watch Hill. He could hardly believe they had come so far. They had probably made the journey as fast as it had ever been traveled. Following Land's example, Rand and Thome, Maryland, dismounted Cloud. Cloud stood head down, sides heaving, lather almost indistinguishable from the horse's smoky sides, flecked the gray's neck and shoulders. Rand thought that Cloud would not be carrying anyone further that night. Much as I would like to put all these villages behind me, Thom announced a few hours rest would not go amiss right now. Surely we have enough of a lead to allow that. Rand stretched, knuckling the small of his back. If we're stopping the rest of the night in Watch Hill, we may as well go on up. A vagrant gust of wind brought a fragrant a fragment of song from the village and smells of cooking that made his mouth water. They were still celebrating in Watch Hill. There had been no Trollocs to disturb their Beltine. He looked for Igwin. She was leaning against Bella, slumped with weariness. The others were climbing down as well, with many a sigh and much stretching of aching muscles. Only the water and the Aesidae showed no visible sign of fatigue. I could do with some singing, Matt put in tiredly, and maybe a hot mutton pie at the white boar. Pausing it, he added, I've never been further than Watch Hill. The white boar's not nearly as good as the wine spring inn. The white boar isn't so bad, Perrin said. A mutton pie for me, too, and lots of hot tea to take the chill off my bones. We cannot stop until we are across the terrain. The terrain. Matt said, our land said sharply, not for more than a few minutes, but the horses, Rand protested, we'll run them to death if we try to go any further tonight. Moraine said, I, surely you, he had vaguely noticed her moving among the horses, but he had not paid any attention to what she did. Now she brushed past him to lay her hands on the clouds, on Cloud's neck. Rand fell silent. Suddenly, the horse tossed his head with a soft wicker, nearly pulling the reins from Rand's hands. The gray danced a step sideways, as restive as if he had spent a week in a stable. Without a word, Moraine went to Bella. I did not know she could do that, Rand said softly to land his cheeks hot. You, of all people, should have suspected it. The water replied, you watched her with your father. She will wash her all the fatigue away, first from the horses, then from the rest of us. The rest of us, not you, not me, she purred her. I don't need it, not yet, and not her. What she can do for others, she cannot do for herself. Only one of us will ride tired. You had better hope she does not grow too tired before we reach Tarvalon. Too tired for what? Rand asked the water. You were right about your Bella, Rand. Moraine said from where she stood by the mare. She has a good heart and as much stubbornness as the rest of you two river folk. Strange as it seems, she may be the least weary of all. A scream ripped the night, ripped the darkness. A sound like a man dying under sharp knives and wings swooped low above the party. The night deepened in the shadow that swept over them. With panicked cries, the horses reared wildly. The wind of the drag car's wings beat at Rand with a feel like the touch of slime, like chittering in the dank dimness of a nightmare. He had no time even to feel the fear of it for Cloud exploded into the air with a scream of his own, twisting desperately as if attempting to shake off some clean, clinging thing. Rand hanging onto the reins was 
jerked off his feet and dragged across the ground, clouds screaming as though the big gray felt wolves tearing at his hawks. Somehow he maintained his grip on the reins, using the other hand as much as his legs. He scrambled onto his feet, taking leaping, staggering steps to keep from being pulled down again. His breath came in ragged pants of desperation. He could not let Cloud get away. He threw out a frantic hand, barely catching the bridle. Cloud reared, lifting him into the air. Rand clung helplessly, hoping against hope that the horse would quieten. The shock of landing jarred Rand to his teeth, but suddenly the gray was still. Nostrils flaring and eyes rolling, stiff-legged and trembling. Rand was trembling as well and all but hanging from the bridle. That jolt must have shaken the full animal too, he thought. He took three or four deep, shaky breaths. Only then could he look around and see what had happened to the others. Chaos reigned among the party. They clutched reins against jerking heads trying with little success to calm the rearing horses that dragged them about in a milling mass. Only two seemingly had no trouble at all with their mounts. Moraine sat straight in her saddle, the white mare stepping delicately away from the confusion as if nothing at all out of the ordinary had happened. On foot, land scanned the sky, sword in one hand and reins in the other. The sleek black stallion stood quietly beside him. Sounds of merrymaking no longer came from Watch Hill. Those in the village must have heard the cry too. Rand knew they would listen a while and perhaps watch for what had caused it, then return to their jollity. They would soon forget the incident, its memory submerged by song and food and dance and fun. Perhaps when they heard the news of what had happened in Edmund's field, some would remember and wonder. A fiddle began to play, and after a moment, a flute joined in. The village was resum resuming its celebration. Mount Land commanded curtly. Sheathing his sword, he leaped onto the stallion. The drag car would not have showed itself unless it had already reported our whereabouts to the murderer. Another strident shriek drifted down from far above, fainter but no less harsh. The music from Watch Hill silenced Ragley once more. It tracks us now, marking us for the half-man. He won't be far. The horses, fresh now as well as fear-struck, pranced and backed away from those trying to mount. A cursing thumb Marilyn was the first into his saddle, but the others were up soon after, all but one. Hurry, Rand, Edwin shouted. The drag car gave shrill voice once more, and Bella ran a few steps before she could rein the mare in. Hurry. With a start, Rand realized that instead of trying to mount Cloud, he had been standing there staring at the sky in a vain attempt to locate the source of those vile shrieks. More all unaware, he had drawn Tam's sword as if to fight the flying thing. His face reddened, making him glad for the night to hide him. Awkwardly, with one hand occupied by the reins, he resheathed the blade, glancing hastily at the others. Moraine Land and Egwin were all were looking at him, though he could not be sure how much they could see in the moonlight. The rest seemed too absorbed with keeping their Horses under control to pay him any mind. He put a hand on the pommel and reached the saddle in one leap, as if he had been doing the like all his life. If any of his friends had noticed the sword, he would surely hear about it later. There would be time enough to worry about it then. As soon as he was in the saddle, they were all off at a gallop again up the road and by the Dome-like hill, dogs barked in the village. Their passage was not entirely unnoticed, or maybe the dogs smelled trollocs, Rand thought. The barking and the village lights alike vanished quickly behind them. They galloped in a knot, horses all but jostling together as they ran. Land ordered them to spread out again. 
but no one wanted to be enough to be even a little alone in the night. A scream came from high overhead. The water gave up and let them run clustered. Rand was close behind Moraine and Lan, the gray straining in an effort to force himself between the water's black and the Esidai's trim mare. Egwin and the Gleeman raced on either flank of him, while Rand's friends crowded in behind. Clouds spurred by the drag, drag car's cries ran beyond anything Rand could do to slow him, even had he wished to, yet the gray could not gain so much as a step on the other two horses. The drag car's shriek challenged the night. Stout Bella ran with neck outstretched and tail and mane streaming in the winds or in the wind of her running, matching the larger horses every stride. The Aesidai must have done something more than simply ridding her of fatigue. Edwin's face in the moonlight was smiling in excited delight. Her braid streamed behind like the horse's manes. And the gleam in her eyes was not all from the moon, Rand was sure. His mouth dropped open in surprise until a, until a swallowed bite them set him off into a fit of coughing. Lan must have asked a question for Moraine suddenly shouted over the wind and the pounding of hooves. I cannot, most especially not from the back of a galloping horse. They are not easily killed even when we when they can be seen. We must run and hope. They gallop through a tatter of fog, thin and no higher than the horse's knees. Clouds sped through it in two strides, and Rand blinked, wondering if he had imagined it. Surely the night was too cold for fog. Another patch of ragged gray whisked by them, then one by them to one side larger than the first. It had been growing as if the mist oozed from the ground. Above them, the Drakkar screamed in rage. Fog enveloped the riders for a brief moment and was gone. Came again and vanished behind. The icy mist left a chill, dampen, or a chill dampness on Rand's face and hands. Then a wall of pale gray loomed before them, and they were suddenly enveloped or enshrouded. The thickness of it muffled the sound of their hooves to dullness, and the cries from overhead seemed to come through a wall. Rand could only just make out the shapes of Egwin and Thome Marilyn on either side of him. Land did not slow their pace. There is still only one place they can only one place we can be going, he called, his voice sounding hollow and directionless. Murdral or sly, Moraine replied. I will use its own slyness against, slyness against it. They galloped on silently. A slidey mist obscured both sky and ground so that the riders themselves turned to shadow, appeared to float through night through night clouds, even the legs of their own horses seemed to have vanished. Rand shifted in his saddle, sh shrinking away from the icy fog, knowing that Moraine could do things, even seeing her do them, was one thing. Having those things leave his skin damp was something else again. He realized he was holding his breath, too, and called himself nine kinds of Idiot, he could not ride all the way to Tar Taran Ferry without breathing. She had used the one power on Tam, and he seemed all right. Still, he had to make himself let that breath go and inhale. The air was heavy, but if colder, it was otherwise no different than that on any other foggy night. He told himself that, but he was not sure he believed it. Lan encouraged him to keep close. Now to stay where each could see the outlines of others in that damp, frosty grayness, yet the water still did not slack. Slack in his stallion's dead run, side by side land, and Moraine led the way through the fog as if they could see clearly what lay ahead. The rest could only trust and follow and hope. 
The shrill cries that had hounded them faded as they galloped and then were gone. But the but that gave small comfort. Forest and farmhouses, moon and road were shrouded and hidden. Dogs still barked hollow and distant in the gray haze when they passed the farms, but there was no other sounds save the dull drumming of their horses' hooves. Nothing in that featureless ashen fog changed. Nothing gave any hint of the passage of time except the growing ache in thigh and back. It had to have been hours, Rand was sure. His hands had clutched his reins until he was not sure he could release them, and he wondered if he would ever walk properly again. He glanced back only once. Shadows in the fog raced behind him, but he could not even be certain of their number or even that they really were his friends. The chill and damp soaked through his cloak and coat and shirt, soaking or soaked his into his bones, so it seemed. Only the rush of air passed his face, and the gather and stretch of the horse beneath him told him that he was moving at all. It must have been hours slow, Rand called suddenly, draw rain. Rand was so startled that cloud forced between land and moraine, forging ahead for half a dozen strides before he could pull the big gray to a halt and stare. Houses loomed in the fog on all sides, the houses strangely tall to Rand's eye. He had never seen this place before, but he had often her descriptions that tallness came from high redstone foundations necessary when the spring melt in the mountains of mist made the Terran overflow its banks. They had reached Terran Ferry. Land trotted the black war horse past him. Don't be so eager, sheep herder. This Discomfited, Rand fell into place without explaining as the party moved deeper into the village. His face was hot, and for the moment, the fog was welcome. A lone dog, unseen in the cold mist, barked at them furiously, then ran away. Here and there, a light appeared in a window as some early riser stirred. Other than the dog, no sound save the muted clops of their horses' hooves disturbed the last hour of the night. Rand had met few people from Taran Ferry. He tried to recall what little he knew of them or knew about them. They seldom ventured down into what they called the lower villages with their noses up as if they smelled something bad. The few he had met bore strange names like Hilltop and Stoneboat. One and all Terran fairy folk had a reputation for slyness and trickery. If you shook hands with a Terran, Terran fairy man, people said, you counted your fingers afterwards. Lan and Moraine stood before a tall, dark house that looked exactly like any other in the village. Fog swirled around the water like smoke as he leapt from the saddle and mounted the stairs that rose to the front door as high above the street as their heads. At the top of the stairs, Lan hammered with his fist on the door. I thought he wanted quiet, Matt muttered. Lan's pounding went on. A light appeared in the window of the next house and someone shouted angrily, but the water kept on with his drumming. Abruptly, the door was flung back by a man in a nightshirt that flapped about his bare ankles, an oil lamp in one hand illumined, illumined a narrow face with pointed features. He opened his mouth angrily, then let it stay open as his, as his head swiveled to take in the fog, eyes bulging. What's this? He said, what's this? Chill gray tendrils curled into the doorway, and he hurriedly stepped back away from them. Master Hightower, Lan said, just the man I need. We want to cross over on your ferry. He never even saw a Hightower. Matt snickered. Rand made 
shushing motions at his friend, the sharp-faced fellow raised his lamp higher and peered down at them suspiciously. After a minute, Master Hightower said crossly, the fairy goes over in daylight, not in the night. Not ever, and not in this fog neither. Come back when the sun's up and the fog's gone. He started to turn away, but Land caught his wrist. The ferryman opened his mouth angrily. Gold glinted in the lamplight as the water counted out coins one by one into the other's palm. Hightower licked his lips as the coins clinked, and by inch and by inches his head moved closer to his and as if he could not believe what he was seeing. And as much again, Land said, when we are safely on the other side, that we leave now. Now, chewing his lower lip, the fairy, the fairy man shifted his feet and peered out at the mist-laden night, then nodded abruptly. Now it is. Well, let loose my wrist. I have to rouse my hollers. You don't think I pull the ferry across myself, do you? I will wait at the ferry, Land said flatly, for a little while. He released his hold on the ferryman. Master Hightower jerked the handful of coins to his chest and nodded, and nodding agreement, hastily shoved the door closed with his hip. Okay, and that is the end of chapter 11. And that was another shorter chapter, and so, well, and I'm also more awake reading today. Sometimes when I'm reading, I'm half asleep. Anyway, uh, so that was chapter 11, and I will be reading chapter 12 in my next video. And I want to thank everyone for watching. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you haven't already, please uh, watch... Uh, the Will of Time uh, TV series on Amazon Prime. That way you can see what they, or how they portrayed uh, this this story um, in their um, TV series. It's a little bit different from the book, but they're both, well, most of it is good. There was a couple of things that I didn't like too much, but anyway, I'll let you guys watch it and make up your own minds. Anyway, so I want uh, I will put my contact information in the description down below in case anybody wants to contact me or send me something. And as always, everyone have a wonderful day and be safe. Bye bye.